Welcome to another edition of Stepping Up to the Plate. So glad you could join me. I'm your host, Michael Vega. And this week I'll be flying solo without my main man, Al Prezzuti, who is away from studio today. But uh, today would have been a momentous uh, exchange if he had been here because uh, Al won his Super Bowl bet against me. Or more accurately, I lost my Super Bowl bet against him. And uh, we were texting each other during the course of the game. Uh, and when the uh, Eagles, the team I bet on, uh, went ahead, I texted him. And I said, Al, you did take the Chiefs, didn't you? And uh, just, to conf- <laughs> just to confirm it. But uh, Al wound up on the winning side uh, with the Super Bowl. Uh, the Chiefs obviously winning an epic game. Uh, I, I thought an epic performance, a heroic performance by none other than uh, Patrick Mahomes, uh, the MVP, who wound up winning the Super Bowl MVP uh, with his performance in a 38-35 to victory over the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, back and forth affair, it was unbelievable. Uh, you know, Mahomes tweaks his ankle in the first half, uh, comes off uh, in the second quarter, in fact, and hobbles off the field, and I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm doing good. And that's when I texted Al. Uh, so, as someone mentioned, you know, karma karma came and visited me in the second half. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it was unbelievable. But uh, as I mentioned, so we're flying solo here today uh, with plenty to discuss, not only with the Super Bowl, Celtics, the Bruins having tremendous, you know, one having a tremendous win and the other having a tremendous effort. Uh, and uh, so both to be lauded, I think. And then, of course, uh, uh, Daytona 500, big American race is coming up this weekend. I don't know if any of you guys uh, out there follow auto racing at all. I, I did for a long time uh, at the Boston Globe. And so uh, still a special uh, weekend here for, for me. Uh, and I'll share some stories about that later. But first we'll go to the Super Bowl, as I mentioned, uh, 38-35 win for the Kansas City Chiefs over the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, You know, it was an unbelievable performance uh, between both quarterbacks, I thought. And uh, it was uh, historic in that it was the first time in Super Bowl history two black quarterbacks started in the game. And, uh, you know, it to me was neither here nor there. But it was uh, a sign of the times and a welcome sign of the times. And I thought, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes now, uh, people are talking about him establishing a legacy, uh, creating a dynastic run between him and Andy Reid, his coach, uh, a la Bill Belichick and Tom Brady, uh, and what they kind of accomplished. And the question was asked, can they do it? And the question remains, who knows? Uh, you know, how long will Andy Reid continue to be in the game? And uh, how long will Patrick Mahomes remain healthy? You know, he's shown that he's prone to these ankle tweaks and he's prone to some injury. Uh, so it'll might, it might be difficult to say, but uh, it looks promising right now. As long as they can keep the roster together in the, uh, in the advent of free agency and, and uh, you know, salary cap, uh, deletions, additions. Uh, in the league now, but the salary cap's going to grow, so it may enable teams to, to keep their rosters together for longer uh, than, than most have been able to. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that uh, Philadelphia, you know, played, played very well until the second half when their defense got exposed a little bit uh, by certain movement of the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, it was brilliant play calling Andy Reid and uh, Eric Bieniemy, their, their offensive coordinator, in how they maneuvered their, their receivers in motion and got them on whip routes that left them with wide open looks at the end zone. Uh, I couldn't believe how a couple of those touchdowns, they just walked in uh, for, for touchdowns. But uh, Philadelphia, you know, not, not to be overlooked, you know, they came right down the field, tied the game in the, in the fourth quarter. 33 all, uh, 35 all. They go for the for the extra, uh, the two point conversion, and Jalen Hurts, who had a tremendous game in his own right, you know, save for one big error, uh, a fumble that led to a uh, uh, a uh, 
fumble recovery for a touchdown by Nick Bolton that uh, got Kansas City back into it. So uh, I thought that, you know, you look at it at the end, that's a, that's a tough mistake, costly mistake. <clears throat> and uh, James Brambury had a, another costly mistake with pass interference call when he was holding, uh, you know, uh, Juju Smith Schuster in the uh, on a play a similar route uh, in the red zone as Kansas City was getting ready to convert, um, and it gave Kansas City a fresh set of downs with time running out, and they were able to kind of set up the winning uh, field goal there at the end, and of course. You know, the admirable thing was that Bradbury stood up and accepted responsibility. He said, yep, that was a mistake on my part. I grabbed the guy, tried to get away with one, and hoping that the officials would look the other way. And there were some people who were up in arms saying, well, the officials should have looked the other way, given the other things they let go. Well, they cannot. They have to call stuff, especially in that moment, in that game, in that situation. I have no qualms with the call. You know, just be consistent. That's the only thing anybody wants is to see a consistency in their, in their calls. And uh, don't let anything go. That's what I say. Don't let anything go. If you see something, call it. If you don't, then don't. And uh, just be consistent about it. And I think that's what all coaches want to see, especially in that game, in that moment on that stage. At any rate, kudos to the Kansas City Chiefs. Kudos to Al Prezzuti, who won the Super Bowl bet with me for the second year in a row after I uh, bet the Bengals last year. So... Al, you've got a steal and ride gift card coming to you, my friend. All righty. Well, you know, the, uh, the other thing that happened was uh, we had some tremendous performances by the Bruins and the Celtics. I'll start with the Celtics. Out in Milwaukee uh, in advance of the All-Star game now, as that, as that is getting close, the Celtics went into a big uh, game against a uh, team that they beat in the Eastern Conference Finals. Uh, or in the Eastern Conference playoffs, I should say, uh, a year ago. And at that time, people were saying, <clears throat> well, the Bucks were missing Chris Middleton, and they did, and they missed him very much. Uh, they didn't have cohesion. They, they, you know, they still had Giannis Antetokounmpo, so you can't dismiss that. But in this game, this rematch, uh, in Milwaukee, the Celtics went into this game severely hamstrung, undermanned, missing four of their top six players in Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Al Horford, and Marcus Smart, all of whom, three of whom are injured, one who was ill. So uh, uh, you, you, you had to rely upon your bench. And let me tell you something. The way those guys played gives me supreme confidence now going forward. And I think it should also send a message to everyone else that the Celtics are for real. You know, if they can take the Milwaukee Bucks into overtime, a healthy, you know, Milwaukee Buck team that had Chris Middleton, that had Giannis, that had Drew Holiday, that had Brook Lopez, that had everybody at their disposal, and yet they were in a tooth and nail fight with the Celtics for all four quarters and into overtime when one turnover led to a game-ending bucket that put the Bucks over top. But let me tell you, Derek White in my book, unbelievable. You know, uh, Malcolm Brogdon, an unbelievable performance, of course. And then, of course, you had Sam Hauser knocking down a three-pointer at the end of regulation to tie it, to send it into overtime. And the, the lasting image I'll have of that game is – of Giannis, bent over at the knees, exhausted, like a pound of flesh had been taken from him. And that's precisely what the Celtics reserves did in that game. So, yeah, they lost in overtime. And I think that what I take away from that is a moral victory. And I know that no one counts those. But let me tell you something. It sent a message. It sent a message to not only that locker room, but to the locker rooms all around the league that, hey, Celtics are going to be a tough out. If they have 12, 15 guys who can play like that, play to co they're connected from, you know, 1 through 15, and that they can beat you, uh, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're going to be a tough out. 
they're going to be a very tough out in this, in this uh, playoff system. But now the big concern is health. You know, uh, Jalen Brown, obviously, with the All-Star game coming up, is not likely to play and uh, certainly, you know, needs to take time off to rest. He had a facial fracture, and uh, that's going to be a tough thing for the Celtics. But, hey, they've weathered the storm, I thought. They weathered the storm. And, uh, you know, I think that gives the guys in that room even more confidence, the starters and the reserves and the reserves in themselves. You know, you had Peyton Man uh, Peyton, Peyton Manning. <laughs> Peyton Pritchard, Peyton Pritchard talking about, you know, well, maybe I should think about getting traded or maybe it might not be the best, might not be the worst thing for me if I can go to another team to play. You know what? I want Peyton Pritchard right here. And last, and last night against the Bucks showed why. Uh, he's still a very good player. He still can give the Celtics valuable minutes off the bench. And he is still someone that this team values. Otherwise, they would have traded him. So that's the reason why he wasn't traded. And I think that's the subtle message that he got from the team. And I hope they don't entertain any other offers. You know, the, the team at the trading deadline did bring in Mike Muscala uh, out of Oklahoma City. Uh, and he's shown to be, uh, again, another person who can give you valuable, valuable minutes and provide some production and some rim protection, and you can play out, out on the floor in space. So uh, I like the addition initially is my initial thought. So Celtics <clears throat> still have some things to do in terms of getting back to health, but taking the Bucks into overtime with a severely hamstrung roster, they only played eight guys, you know, all told, against uh, a Bucks team that had its full complement of weapons uh, you know, I, th I thought was, you know, it had my attention from throughout its entirety. And so, meanwhile, you know, they, uh, the Bruins were playing in Dallas. And so I was really, my attention was fixed on what was going on in, in Milwaukee because of the fact that you didn't have everyone there. And I wanted to see how this team would respond. You know what? And they acquitted themselves very well in my book. So, you know, hats off to the Celtics for, you know, playing as hard as they did. And we'll know that we'll continue to get those kinds of efforts. So I think Celtics fans, rest assured that, you know, this, this team is not on the verge of implosion right now. I think they're, you know, they, they're gaining some traction now. All righty. And the same can be said for the Bruins. The Bruins who wound up going out to Dallas to start a, a road trip, and that'll take them to Nashville next. But, uh what an unbelievable performance uh, out there in Dallas by the Bruins, their siblings, the siblings trip. Everyone brought, you know, a sibling with them. And uh, Pavel Zaka had his sister there. And, of course, uh, Charlie McAvoy with his sister. Uh, Brad Marchand with a brother. And it was, it, was, it was neat to see they're all sitting together in a box there uh, down in, uh, in Dallas uh, at the arena. But uh, let me tell you, Unbelievable performances from uh, guys like, you know, Brandon Carlo, Charlie McAvoy, Pavel Zaka, who had a great goal, uh, you know, set up by Brandon Carlo with a nice pass. And then, of course, you had, you know, the game winner in overtime uh, by David Pasternak on a brilliant pass from Charlie McAvoy that put the Bruins on top three to two. And, you know, they have to feel very good. In a, in a game that was pitted as the Eastern Conference and Western Conference leaders, you know, this had a playoff intensity. This game, especially in the third period, when the Bruins were pushing for that winning goal in regulation, uh, you saw how hard they were playing and how energized they were and, and how they brought more energy to the proceeding. And, you know, it was, it was great to see that. Uh, and I thought that in the end, they, they had more offensive zone time than the Stars did, and they really put puck pressure there uh, on, on their goalie. And so I thought that was an uh, unbelievable performance there for the Bruins to go to Dallas uh, and to beat uh, the Stars and to also get the encouraging news that Jake DeBrusque, who's been out with uh, a, a fractured, I think a fibula, I want to say, 
is uh, had begun skating and is close to joining the team. So it'll be uh, interesting to see what they continue to do, how they add or not here with uh, you know uh, midseason trades uh, underway in in the league. And uh, but this was a game that I thought uh, was an interesting maybe harbinger of things to come. You know if these two teams meet in the uh, in the playoffs some, somewhere down the road, more, more than likely a Stanley Cup. But uh, the Bruins still very much, you know, in the driver's seat here in the Eastern Conference and not letting up the rope, not letting go of the rope and uh, not letting go of the wheel, to use a few cliché terms. <laughs> but there was, uh, I, I think, just an unbelievable, uh, I, I want to say there's still buzz, there's still excitement. And you know what the thing that got me, too? was just a turnout of Bruins fans. Now, you know, Bruins nations, you know, I got to give it up to you. The Bruins faithful, they show up. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's far-flung West Coast games. Bruins fans go out to go watch the Bruins play if they're living out there. So I don't know how many are traveling, but, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of Bruins fans who traveled to Dallas, the Dallas area, to see this game. And uh, they were there in that arena in full force. And, uh, you know, they were shouting down the Stars fans. Stars fans were shouting. And, the, and you could tell the decibel level in that building was, was just through the roof. And so, you know, I think Bruins fans had a lot to do with that. So kudos to them. And, you know, they're going to have a strong turnout again in Nashville and wherever they go. And uh, to me, it's just extraordinary how many of them can get tickets to these games, you know, uh, that Stars fans are giving up so that they can show up to these games. But... Uh, at any rate, it was uh, heartening to see that. And I'm sure that the Bruins also uh, were heartened to see that as well. And, you know, they feed off that energy, uh, mostly positive energy they feed off of. And that's why they probably had so much success uh, this year at TD Garden. So at any rate, great job by the Bruins in that victory, 3-2 in overtime. And equally great job by the Celtics. In, the, uh, in that loss over by overtime at Milwaukee against the Bucks, And so we look forward to seeing both teams continue to progress, continue to have success as they march towards the playoffs here. And uh, another team that's marching towards the playoffs is the Milton High girls hockey team. Congratulations to Coach Matt Lodi and the Wildcats. They're ranked uh, number 12 in the power rankings. 17, I believe, in the Globe Top 20 poll. Uh, they're on the climb at 15, 1, and 3 now. And uh, they had uh, uh, nice wins here uh, as they get ready and gear up towards the postseason. So we'll see, you know, what kind of run they make. But uh, congratulations to them. We look forward to more success from the Lady Wildcats there. And we hope that they, uh, they uh, have a great season, the postseason run. So we'll be keeping an eye on them. I uh, urge you to get out to Eulen Rink if they're able to host a game. Or even if not, you know, do like the Bruins do. You know, they bring their fans to their, to, to, on the road with them. So, you know, fill up your gas tank and get out there. <laughs> Maybe easier said than done. But at any rate, uh, congratulations, Coach Matt Lodi and all the Milton High uh, the girls hockey team you know, on a great uh, season that they've had. So uh, we want to talk a little bit, too, now about that other – Great American event, the Daytona 500. I know a lot of you probably uh, uh, watch it or don't. Uh, I've followed it for a long time. It's uh, the Daytona 500 is uh, it is one of those unique American events. You know, they call it the Great American Race for uh, not for nothing. But uh, it, it draws such a, a, a huge crowd every year down to Daytona. It's kind of like the spring, you know, spring training baseball and we'll talk about that in a bit but in Daytona as well you know the it's a harbinger of, of, of spring I think and of course it's the crown jewel event for NASCAR in their cup series and uh, which is their premier touring series and it's like they open the season with the Super Bowl the NFL ends its season with the Super Bowl Daytona is the Super Bowl for NASCAR and they kick off the season in grand fashion and uh, this year, it's going to be interesting to see uh, with a couple guys, you know, making their last runs. Kevin Harvick has called, has said that he will uh, uh, retire at end of season. 
multiple cup champion and uh, also Daytona 500 winner as well. He had a memorable win uh, one year that I covered it. Uh, he denied Mark Martin, uh, who's a longtime favorite and uh, who went winless in his career at Daytona, but by inches, inches uh, came close to winning his first and would have been only, but was denied by Kevin Harvick in a drag race for the ages to the checkered flag uh, in a interminable Daytona 500 that was uh, halted by rain and then obviously, uh, you know, pushed back to a Monday and then the rain forced a delayed start and then finally they got it on the way and they got it in at night and uh, it was funny because I think Kevin Harvick at the time had the uh, the line of the of, of the whole race when he told the media afterwards that you know once it once it got dark out on that speedway he said it seemed like the fangs came out of everybody all the drivers you know and they were just like going for it so it's an extraordinary sight to behold in person which I've been fortunate to have done uh, several times you know 20 25 times now and uh, it's uh, to see these cars running nose to tail you know at 200 miles an hour on a high bank speedway uh, it, it's it's just thrilling it really is and uh, and the thing that you know when when they get to bumping each other and then sliding and wrecking and everything you, you, you think of them as matchbox cars, but they're not, you know. You realize there are people involved, there are people in there. Uh, I come to mind, you know, the horrific crash that Ryan Newman had at the end of the race where his car comes tumbling across the finish. It cat, catches fire, they put it out, and he had gotten hit on the, uh, on the roof deck by another car, and it, it, it looked pretty iffy, and uh, he winds up getting extracted from that wreckage taken to the hospital. The next day he walks out of the hospital with his two daughters uh, hand in hand. And so, you know, and uh, you're happy for that guy uh, that he got, got out and was able to walk away and that he's still around. So, you know, that's a, uh, it's a great event, great event to cover. And I think that, uh, you know, it's gonna be a, uh, interesting to, to watch this year, especially if the sun's out. And uh, I think it's going to be just as sunny here this weekend. But at any rate, it's going to be uh, great to watch. And all the way across the state, in the Sunshine State over in Fort Myers, the Red Sox, who have uh, begun in earnest spring training efforts uh, with pitchers and catchers reporting this week, are underway now. And unfortunately, Alex Cora having to address or not address uh, Revelations in a book about the cheating scandal that followed him in 2017 with the Astros and how, uh, you know, he's already served his penance now, uh, having been suspended for the entirety of the year and, uh, and come back. Is it fair now to relitigate it? I don't think so. You know, he's owned up to it. He paid his price. And I don't know what good is served by a book coming out about it now. Uh, are they looking to get him banned for life from, from baseball? Uh, I don't know. I think the commissioner's office has already addressed the matter. And, uh, you know, time to move on perhaps. You know, time to move on on this thing. And I think that's what he's espousing is that, look, you know, I owned up to this thing. I was involved, yes, and, and I paid my price. And for that, I'm eternally sorry and regret, regretted the mistake. I'm just grateful that I have another opportunity you know, I think he's handled it well in that regard. And uh, no need for him to address it any further. And I think his first press conference, he says, look, I'm not talking about that anymore. We're here to talk about baseball. We're here to talk about this team. We're here to talk about, you know, the things that matter right now. And uh, he's got a lot to address. You know, first and foremost, the health of his roster. You know, where is Chris Sale in his uh, recovery efforts? Where is, you know, how, how are some of these guys that have been banged up, uh, you know, Trevor Story is going to be gone for a bit, uh, possibly the entire the entirety of the year, and then he's he's got to solve the issues of his middle infield. You know, uh, they brought in a couple guys, uh, uh, Alberto uh, Mondesi. They traded for him, and uh, they like what they see. They went out and got uh, uh, Yoshida from Japan, who's going to be setting up as the projecting now the starting center fielder and. 
uh, Kike Hernandez will be working over to uh, the shortstop side. And second base, I think it's still an open question. Don't know what's going to happen there. You know, how will Bobby Dalbeck come back? Uh, will he be someone that they look to, uh, to maybe move? Uh, you know, a lot of interesting pieces. And, and of course, you know, what kind of production will they get from their, their pitching staff? And uh, right now, it's, uh, you got Corey Kluber, you got Chris Sale, Nick Pavetta, uh, Brian Bello, and I don't know if they're going to make, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, maybe Tanner Houck possibly, or they're going to move him to the, the bullpen. So, you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they maneuver that. And uh, the Red Sox have a lot to make up, and of course, it's all going to be predicated on the success, you know, their ability to score runs. And I think it was hampered by the fact that they let a guy go in Xander Bogarts, who was always a productive. He was on base a lot, uh, you know, and, and he brought more intangibles, I think, uh, than just, you know, production on the field. It was off the field, I think, that he kind of kept the uh, clubhouse tight knit, you know, all moving in the same direction. And he was a class guy and we wish him well in San Diego. Hated to see him go. And so we'll see how Heim Bloom, you know, uh, the roster that he's assembled now, how it uh, performs. And of course, you know, they placed all their uh, chips on all in bet on Rafael Devers. And, you know, cannot let, could not have let another generational talent like that kid uh, walk. Otherwise, it would have been a damning indictment on this organization uh, that should be involved in any major free agent that's on the market, uh, always should be in the mix, you know, and it's not enough to say, oh yeah, we were in on that guy. You gotta be able to go get that guy. You know, you gotta be able to do what the Yankees do. You know, when they see someone that they covet and they wanna get, they get them. They go out and get them. And uh, let me tell you something, if Otani ever comes on the market, I don't want the Red Sox just to say, oh well, we, we, we were in on it with them. You know, make a, a concerted effort to go get a guy like that. You know, those, those are treasured talents. And so, at any rate, we'll see if that comes to pass. But uh, it's on Heim Bloom now. You know, it's on this organization now. And uh, I think the Red Sox fans spoke loudly at the winter, you know, uh, winter carnival or whatever they call it, when John Henry and the all of the brass who are roundly booed, you know, for exclaiming that it's, you know, players are expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. They're expensive everywhere, you know. And, but don't tell me you don't have the means or the resources. So at any rate, we'll see what happens there. Well, it looks like uh, I'm getting the uh, signal that it's time to land here, my solo flight without my main man, Al Prezzuti, who will look forward to having back soon here on Stepping Up to the Plate. But I want to thank you for joining me and for tolerating me for all this time. All righty. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time on Stepping Up to the Plate.